Hey everybody, welcome back to The Fin Factor. I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. And this is episode number 165. We're here in Gilroy at Calorane Wines, uh, celebrating a very special guest that we'll have here. Uh, Oscar award winning US citizen, uh, fresh off of his 2000th NHL game call, Randy Hahn. Thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. So, uh, Randy, the, the last time that you were on the show, um, <laughs> you had made a joke, something about the C Canadian kids when they're born, that they're born with hockey sticks, yes. right? And I, see, he already knows. So I had thought that that was the end of the joke. And so I jumped in and said something to the effect of, oh, they aren't, you know, trying to be cute. But he wasn't done. Uh, and then you kicked off the last part, uh, the last punchline part of that joke, which is that's why the births are so hard. And I felt bad because I knew that I screwed up his joke. Randy looks over at me with this very disappointed face and he says, don't step on my punchline. And I have to tell you, Randy, every time I think talking to Randy Hahn, that is the first thing that comes to mind every single time. Well, don't feel too bad. You weren't the first person to screw up one of my jokes. I usually screw most of them up myself. <laughs> Sounds good. So yeah, it was just uh, one of those things that, you know, it, it stuck with me. So if you're gonna be making any jokes tonight, please feel free to give me the and I will wait until the punchline is done and we'll, we'll go from there. Or as Dan Rusinowski famously on radio over years has made his color commentator wait to cut in because he replays his goal calls on the post game show. <laughs> the hand goes up <laughs> into the face of the color commentator and then when the hand goes down, you can speak. So I'll just give you I love what it. we call the Ruzi. I will not be offended whatsoever <laughs> by the Ruzi. That's awesome. So you've got a few milestones here. Uh, first and foremost, you are an exclusive club. Uh, only three people now um, to have visited the Fin Factor twice. Wow. So congratulations on that one, first and foremost. Okay? I, it's, it's a privilege. <laughs> and then obviously... Do I get a ribbon? Or? We'll, we'll, we'll figure that one okay. out. Maybe we have a hat or something. You can add that onto your LinkedIn profile. As a, <laughs> yes. As a thing. Yeah, it's like a, a badge. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Boy Scout badge. <laughs> uh, before we get to the main one, um, Aaron's going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the milestones you have, U.S. citizen. Yeah, this July. Congratulations. You're now a U.S. citizen. Thank you. Are you sure you wanted to do that? Yeah, no, I was absolutely <laughs> sure um, I did wait 40 years yeah. so as Drew Remenda said you know make sure you give it a good think <laughs> you know four decades you should be able to figure it out by then but uh, yeah I finally uh, plunged into uh, US citizenship and was happy to do so uh, both my sons are born in the US uh, my wife's American uh, and uh, I've been here for 40 years and made my life here and my career here and everything I have pretty much except for my sister and her f side of the family and some other relatives are in Canada, but everything else is here. So it was finally time to go ahead. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm, I'm a dual citizen, so they didn't yeah. make me um, put my Canadian passport into the shredder, which they, I guess, used to do. Yeah. They wouldn't shred it, they would just take it from you, and it was like a passport swap. Interesting. Um, but I think when they had the uh, NAFTA trade agreement between the US, Canada, and Mexico, you can now keep two passports, so uh, uh, just, you know, judiciously use the various yeah. passport in certain times. You That's know? good. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, so you had to take a test for this. I did. And you had to pass, was it six of 10? Six out of 10. Did you have to really study hard for this? I did. I, yeah. I studied very hard. And um, I was expecting to have to answer 10. And then at the end, they would tell you, OK, you got seven out of 10. Yeah. But I nailed the first six. <laughs> and the, the person who did the exam with me, and it's a person to person thing, yeah. even though we're just coming out of the pandemic. Um, and I think before that, they were either weren't doing them or they were doing them um, remotely. Uh, he, he stopped at six. He says, you got all six. You don't have to go any further. <laughs> so number six, I will quiz you guys on. Oh, no. Who was the president of the United States during World War I? Woodrow For Wilson? the sixth and final question and your chance at a passport. Woodrow Wilson? Correct. <laughs> you are <laughs> correct, Woodrow Wilson. Sir. Excellent. Well, well done. Well said. Nice. You, get to, you get to remain a U.S. citizen, <laughs> yeah. and I don't know, you're on the you're on the border now. Uh -huh. no, I hear Sweden is really nice this time of year. Anyway, I do. So. I do have a degree in history. Yeah, so you move I, back I to Switzerland when right? Timo retires. There you go. And stay neutral. 
That's awesome. Uh, and I, I got to read about a little bit about your ceremony, your unceremony. Yeah, I've actually was, been to two of the ceremonies before the pandemic, so I got to see what it was like. Well, um, I used to live in Campbell. I live in Gilmore right now, mm -hmm. but Campbell was famous for being one of the sites for the um, swearing-in yeah. citizenship mm -hmm. ceremonies. And there, uh, there's a concert uh, venue there of some kind, mm -hmm. and that was a famous place. Uh, but because of the pandemic and the immigration service is still kind of transitioning out of it, yeah. they weren't doing those big gatherings. So this was literally drive-through <laughs> citizenship. Wow. I did have to go in and do the in-person interview and all that and file my paperwork and whatnot. But the day I actually received my certificate of citizenship, I drove up to the citizen office. It's on Coleman Avenue in San Jose, across from Costco, if mm -hmm. you know where mm -hmm. that is, yeah. kind of by San Jose Airport. And I thought it was gonna be an outdoor ceremony. Well, we get there at 7.30 in the morning, and all we see are cones snaked through the parking lot and cars inching their way through the, the, the lanes. So we finally get to the, the front, and I said, don't we do it out, don't we all stand outside? He says, no, it's all drive through, <laughs> and please keep your window rolled up. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I got to a certain port part, and I had to hand in my green card. So there's, a, there's a, and you know, you go, goodbye green card, you know, I've had you for 40 years, and you hand that off. Then you get to the front of the line, they, they do let you out of the car, only the person being sworn in. So anybody else in your car can't come through. Uh, and I, I stood out with maybe 12 people. Mm -hmm. The guy who swore us in, and then I, I'm ready, Pledge of Allegiance, right? <laughs> I got it nailed. Memorize it. Didn't get to do it. <laughs> he did it and said, do you agree? And I'm like, this is the, like, the easiest test ever. So you all want to agree. But he was super excited because I was like the third or fourth per person from the Sharks who he had sworn oh. in over the years. He did Nabokov and I oh, think wow. he did Mike Ricci when he yeah. um, became a dual citizen. So he was so excited that I was there, but I was bummed because no Pledge of Allegiance and no gathering with a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, it was in front of the dumpster. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. If you look at my pictures that the Mercury News um, and some sites put up, you can see a dumpster in the Jeez. back. And then we wanted some nice pictures. My, my wife and my mother-in-law and sister-in-law were there with me and, and some uh, other family. So the closest place to do it was across the street in the parking lot at Costco, <laughs> which at 8 a.m. is fairly empty. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few like motorhomes that have spent the night. Yeah. So we had a cheering section. Uh, but yeah, we took some pictures there and it was a little bit bizarre and, um, you know, but I, I'm, I'm certified. So, uh, and, and I even have my passport now, which I had to, um, expedite to go to uh, Berlin and Prague. Oh, yeah. But I'm good to go. So anywhere the sharks send me now, I'm, I'm golden. <laughs> That's very American to do it in a Costco parking lot. I it's think so. I think more. so. Yeah. Yeah. Capitalist. Hey, it's great. It's, it's, uh, we uh, celebrated with um, uh, mochas and churros. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Frozen mochas. Nice. So did you, you, 40 years of studying, were you nervous at all for the test? Because <laughs> I think you, you had enough practice, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I was, I was uh, a little bit nervous going in on the, uh, the exam, but, uh, you know, some of the questions were very basic, like, um, uh, what was Abraham Lincoln known for? Oh, okay. And, and a, the wrong answer is getting shot in a theater. <laughs> um, right. But uh, uh, Vampire hunting, right? right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so a movie. lot of them were, were um, slam dunks. But nice. uh, knowing Woody Wilson, you, you would have had to study for that one, yeah. which obviously Aaron did as well. Right. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you. Uh, so 2000 NHL games called uh, quite the milestone. That you, and like you had said, you're fresh off of this. You haven't done game 2001 yet, and you're you're sitting here talking with us about it. So uh, again, thank you for being here for that. Oh, my pleasure. Um, now, how, how many of those were non-sharks? Because you did call games at a national level and for other teams uh, here and there. So those are you, all sharks. Games. They're all sharks games. So that that was a little bit of a misnomer. The, okay. Those those were NHL games for the sharks. Gotcha. So I've done other games. Uh, I not calling play by play, but I also worked on the broadcasts of the Vancouver Canucks, uh, Edmonton Oilers. LA Kings. Mm -hmm. um, so those were my other NHL involvements. 
in addition to doing some games for NBCSN and last year in the playoffs for TNT. Uh, but no, we just counted Sharks games and just Sharks regular season games wow. uh, because that's when, when the players get the silver stick, yes. yeah. which apparently mine's in the mail, um, <laughs> the silver mic, silver uh, they count only regular season games. I could yeah. never understand why they played the playoff games. Yep. They yeah. should count, but they don't. So the Sharks said to me when we started thinking about um, starting to count these things and come up with a number, uh, let's just count regular season because it got a little hard to find records of which playoff games I did back in the 90s and 2000s mm -hmm. and which ones I didn't in which years. So we just said, we'll leave those out. So if you throw those in, there's probably about another 175 uh, games of wow. Sharks playoffs and other team games. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so 2000 Sharks only regular season TV games. Absolutely <laughs> unreal. That That's number amazing. is, it's unfathomable really when you think about how many well, games. Here's the best stat. Yeah. We thought it up today. You figure, he scores! About five seconds, right? Yeah. yeah. You average out the average NHL game. That was going to be good. <laughs> that was going to be the good. The average NHL game, six goals. Yeah. Fair, you know, four, two, three, uh, you know, mm -hmm. five, one, the odd time. It would take me 41 days <laughs> nonstop going, he scores! <laughs> to call all the goals that it took in 20 years. Oh, I man. think the first month would be okay, but that's, those last 11 days oh. would be tough. Your voice would be gone, yeah. completely gone. Yeah, pretty much. That's a great stat. Darren Stevens, eat your heart out. Yeah. I know, oh, take that shark stats. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever uh, give Patty Marlowe any kind of... Uh, hard time. Saying? Yeah, hard time, thank you. Give him a hard time for uh, beating him out on games. No, no, I had, <laughs> no, I am never going to give a player a hard time because, look, I come to work, I get to eat in the press, <laughs> press room, I'm wearing a suit, they have a nice comfortable chair for me. In some of the arenas, there's a little heater by my oh. feet, and I talk for two and a half hours. There's absolutely no heavy <laughs> lifting. So the last thing I'm going to do is try and uh, upstage a player because what they do is a, no, that's another whole deal. Nobody's firing pucks at me. Oh, and I don't get traded if I suck. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, I actually have a, a two part question here about, um, about you doing play by play. One is, do you find yourself on a daily basis just play by playing random things like in your head? Do, do you just kind of have a little voice in your head that's just doing it by itself? Number one. Number two, before you started doing it, were you practicing doing play by play with just anything random that you see? Or how, how did you get to the point where, you know, now you're, you've done 2000 NHL games for the Sharks? Right. Well, I'll answer the second part first. Okay. I don't remember as a kid being that way, you know, describing, um, you know, my mom decorating the Christmas tree <laughs> and the icing goes on and there's a bulb, oh, it's dry, you know, <laughs> even in my head. So I didn't do that, um, but I guess somewhere along the line I was wired for it yeah. uh, in some way and I don't consciously do it now, but I do find myself sometimes when I'm performing just tasks around the house or trying to get a series of things done at home, like I'll count them in my head, the steps, I'll go one, two, three, four, five, and it's, you know, in your, there's a cadence in your head, mm -hmm. and I think that's probably part of the uh, manic me under there that is a play-by-play -play <laughs> guy, but um, I don't watch games uh, and do the play-by-play -play in my head, even like last Friday was an ESPN Plus game mm -hmm. um, in Anaheim, and of course I'm watching it at home, I didn't do that game. Uh, I'm not trying to call the game. Now I'm listening, and, and if there's a mistake or something, I'm like, hey, that's a mistake, yeah. <laughs> which I'm sure all the other announcers do when I'm doing it. Hey, Han, you made a mistake. But um, no, I, I don't find myself consciously doing it, but I'm sure somewhere deep in my subconscious that that has to have been going on for a long time and probably still does. Nice. Um, Aaron wanted to ask you about this, uh, and it was about your favorite players to interview. Now, I think we had asked in the first time that you came on and you had said that you didn't have a favorite specifically because they all kind of get trained by their agents now yeah. to be boring. That was kind of what you had talked about, but you liked talking with Dan Boyle because he was very fresh and yes. you know very honest and upfront. Same with Logan Couture at the time, who right. at the time was not the captain and then 
lo and behold, that actually translated well to him becoming a captain. So sure. um, go ahead, Aaron. You, you wanted to ask about specific eras, I think, is what, what well, you Well, kind of like it, breaking down the eras of Sharks hockey, kind of like the first beginning 91 through 94, and then 95 to 99, and like every kind of five, 10 years. Oh, boy. That, that, <laughs> you're asking me to think back to a lot of guys that were interviewed. And, you know, one of the things, too, about when I do, for the most part, play off, player interviews, the only time I do them is after a game, mm -hmm. and it's only after we win. win. When we lose, if you notice, we don't interview a Sharks player because we figure, uh, you know, especially when we're on the road, we're trying to get to the next city, they've just lost. You know, what are you going to ask these guys? Yeah. You know, how come you lost 5-1? What happened to the penalty <laughs> kill? Whatever. So we do interview players only after they win, and it's usually three questions. So I open with the first question. Then if it's Hetty or Brett, mm -hmm. they get the second. And then I ask, ask that third and wrap it up. But, you know, every once in a while you get uh, better uh, interviews than others. You know, and way back in the day, interviewing Arturs Urbe was like <laughs> gold because, you know, he was just different. Yeah. You know, he was coming from a different place. And then so was Igor Larionov, just a mm -hmm. really highly intelligent guy. Uh, and, you know, some of the worst interviews would be guys who were the who were some of the funniest guys, like Mike Ricci. Like, <laughs> when you talk to Ricci in person, he's hilarious and he's funny. And then the light comes on and he's on camera and he's just Mr. Cliche. <laughs> yeah, we tried to get pucks deep and, you know, work hard. And, you know, we'll just have to be all be 10% better next game. You know, I, I'm just summarizing his, uh, his cliches. But we actually have some really good ones right now. Nico Sturm mm -hmm. is a really good talker. Soccer. He's uh, he's a really smart guy. In addition to, I think he's been a real uh, great addition to us as a player. We had Capo Kakinen on after his shutout uh, in Montreal recently, mm -hmm. and he was terrific. And we had had him on once before, and he wasn't that good. But I think a little more comfortable in his skin in in teal and, and things like that. And plus, coming off a shutout, that's yeah. when you want to interview a goalie, yeah. right? He's feeling really good about himself. And Nick Chichek. Another guy who's just up from the Barracuda, but he's really smart. His father is a, um, a PhD who teaches biochemistry at the <laughs> University of Manitoba. Like, wow, I mean, wow. he's like a brainiac. Um, and obviously some of that trickled down to his hockey playing yeah. son. And, uh, and he's apparently not been con concussed frequently because he can, <laughs> uh, he's a really good talker and he has things to say. And, and there's other guys within that group too. Uh, that are interesting and, and I think when it's the right person talking to him in the right setting Eric Carlson is very glib mm -hmm. uh, He's very good with the Canadian media that he knows from Ottawa mm -hmm. and the, the guys from Hockey Night in Canada uh, He recently had a good back-and-forth with um, Elliot Friedman yeah. on yeah. national TV. He's very good in that setting um, and, and we, we, we're not at the point yet where we've gotten that out of uh, Eric on our broadcast and again in our setting It's just those quick little bites uh, to be honest with you, when we put players on in that post game, uh, quite often it's just to get their faces on TV with their helmets mm -hmm. off so the fans can see them. Uh, and especially the ones who might not be hardcore fans, they're going like, I keep hearing about this Eric Carlson guy. What does he look like? Yeah. Well, his helmet's off, and now you get to see what this guy looks like. So uh, that's what those interviews are like. Uh, are like. And, um, you know, every once in a while, there's a chance for a more long-form interview. Uh, I recently did some on the Sharks Audio Network, which were really good. Uh, they were done over Zoom with uh, Jeff Odgers. Mm -hmm. we, d we delved into his background on the family farm and how he came up through junior hockey and, and, and being tough and what, what that mm -hmm. was like and being, the f being a captain for the Sharks as a tough guy, which is not common. Uh, I did another one with Tori Mitchell about his journey uh, through hockey and, and with the Sharks and when he was involved in the play that broke Curtis Foster's leg and then he came back the next training camp and his his leg yeah. was broken and all that. And, uh, you know, just some good funny stories about the guys back in the day. So uh, check those out on the uh, Sharks Audio Network because they are on a loop. I think they play them from time to time. Uh, those are fun to do and it would be nice to do more. Nico, Nico Sturm is a guy that we've... Uh really enjoyed taking clips from for the show this this season uh, yeah. since he's only been on the season but very smart and I feel like he's one of those players that will eventually become a coach or somewhere in the front office because his brain is just it's very different and is that one of the examples that I gave was um, someone asked him a question about a hit on somebody else and he goes I haven't seen it and then usually that's it 
then he expands it. He goes, well, I didn't see it because I was on the shift and my back was to him on the ice and I was skating this way towards the bench. So I didn't get a chance to see it and I haven't been able to see the replay yet. So I can't really comment on it. It's like, wow, you really expanded on right. an answer yeah. that all, was, all you could have said was, I didn't see it. I don't know. That's Sounds it. like a coach or, it, you know, if he wants to make a lot less money, a broadcaster. <laughs> <laughs> he, would be, he would be a great addition as a color commentator. Yeah, I agree. I yeah. think he's got a future in it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, the, you just said a bunch of names that were new names, actually, so like uh, like Sturm and, and whatnot, right? So mm -hmm. um, there's a whole new regime now, right? Um, Doug Wilson and his crew uh, and a lot of the players from last season as well. A lot of them moved on. The coaching staff's all moved on, right? Um, so with this, this whole new regime coming in, first of all, was it difficult because especially with Doug Wilson, he'd been there for so long. Was it difficult to kind of say goodbye to, to him uh, along with the rest of the crew? But uh, I guess for me, it, I can understand how it'd be more difficult to, to say goodbye to him specifically. But with that whole group that's, that's moved on as of this year, right, this off season, right. um, how difficult was that for you? Well, when it comes to coaching staffs, you know, you, you kind of get used to it in this business. Uh, the average lifespan, you know, most of the time is like four or five years. Yeah. And if the success isn't there, uh, you know, changes have been made. And especially recently for the Sharks, you know, that's what happened. DeBoer came in and had his run. And then, you know, he was gone. And then, you know, Bugner comes in and he had his run and now he's gone and now we're, we're with David Quinn. But before that, we had some really long stretches where, where coaches were here for a long time, like Daryl Sutter and Todd McClellan, uh, Ron Wilson even. Yeah. They were there for a long time. So we're a little more used to that. The Doug Wilson situation was different because he you know, started to tip us off early in the season that, that something wasn't right. Uh, right after his Hockey Hall of Fame induction in Toronto, which was in November. Mm -hmm. And it was about a week after that that the Sharks put out the announcement that Doug was taking a leave of absence for an undisclosed medical reason, uh, and, and he stepped aside. So that was kind of the beginning of the end, although we didn't know it. You know, the, the hope was and the, the thought was, you know, Doug's going to take care of whatever Doug needs to take care of, and he'll come back. Well, as it turned out, that didn't happen, and then in April... Um, he announced that he was uh, leaving the organization and was, you know, saying goodbye. So that one was was kind of a slow burn. It wasn't a shock. Yeah. It was a slow uh, progression to the uh, the finality of him leaving the organization. But you talk about a run of almost two decades uh, as a general manager. There's very few that can say that. Mm -hmm. uh, and and had our team in the hunt for most of those years and took us to the Stanley Cup final the one year and to a few other conference finals uh, before that. You know, a tremendous run uh, and, and made a tremendous trade to get Joe Thornton, which yep. changed the franchise, and then did a great job of complimenting around Jumbo. He already had Marlowe, but, you know, Pavelski's development and, and the goaltending um, decisions they made along the way, you know, Nabby uh, for the, a big chunk of that, but staying competitive with other goalies um, after that, whether it was uh, Niemi or um, Tuscala mm -hmm. or Nidimaki or, you know, whoever it was <laughs> yeah. the, at that time. So, you know, in as much as the Joe Thornton trade was, you know, ginormous, franchise changing. Um, you know, you still need the other pieces around them, as we've seen with mm -hmm. a team like the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah. You know, Connor McDavid is the best player in the NHL. He can't do it alone. Um, uh, Wayne Gretzky was the best player in the world, but he didn't win a Stanley Cup with the New York Rangers. They just couldn't get the right pieces around him. And Doug, Doug came so close so many years to getting all those pieces. And then near the end, after he got Carlson, uh, you know, the thought was, oh man, we got Carlson, Burns, and Vlasic. And that's when Vlasic was still at his peak. Yeah. And Burns wasn't that many seasons removed from the Norris Trophy. Mm -hmm. With those three guys and the amount of minutes they can play, one of them is going to be on the ice the whole game. But that never, and a lot, a lot of times too, but a lot of times because of injury, one of them wasn't even in the lineup. Yeah. Um, during those couple of years. So it never quite worked out. Of course, the price was paid in draft picks to get those guys, and all of a sudden, the players you need through your pipeline to fill a lot of those uh, third and fourth line roles and your, um, your five and six and seven defense and maybe a goaltending 
prospect coming up through the system, those, those things started to slow down and dry up to the point where, you know, today we're paying that price and, and trying to build the thing back up uh, with Mike Greer. Yeah, and I, and I love that you brought up Eric Carlson and, and, and Burns and Velasquez because we all want to ask you questions about that a little bit sure. later on. Um, but staying on the topic of, of Mike Greer specifically, what, what are the main differences that you've seen uh, between the two eras, right? The Doug Wilson era. And I mean, obviously we're not even a whole season into the Mike Greer era, but um, I, we've noticed, you know, he brings in a lot of uh, staff that is gonna help with development, right? Um, he's bolstered the, uh, the front office where maybe somebody was having several hats on at one time. He's got that fanned out to four different people now. So what are some of the main differences you've seen between uh, Doug Wilson's tenure and what Mike Greer has started to do here? Well, one of the things you just hit on was Mike grew the organization, the hockey department side of things. Uh, the Sharks per se didn't have an analytics department, a full-blown organized analytics department. Uh, and that's something that happened uh, when he hired Tom Holy as assistant general manager. Mm -hmm. Holy's job, and I'm sure he's still, you know, putting that together. That you don't instantly snap yeah. your fingers and bring together all the people that you want. But that was that was critical. Uh, player development, uh, specifically, um, you know, identifying people in in um, scouting that were just going to scout the first or second round kind of players. Mm -hmm. And then other scouts who were going to be looking for those players who would maybe fall to lower rounds. Really uh, specific um, job titles for things like that. Uh, an advisor like Doug Waite, um, mm -hmm. a new director of uh, player development and Todd Marshawn. And these are all players that Greer played with in Edmonton when they were all young guys coming up together. Uh, strong bond and th those guys go way back. They've been through a lot together and they've been friends for a long time. Uh, so really bolstering some of those uh, things, some of which were already in place, but just kind of uh, beefing them up. And then on the ice, uh, I think it was clear uh, by the end of last year that for a couple of years in a row, you know, and, and sure it was through the pandemic, whatever, but I think the Sharks threw a lot of young players into the lineup at the NHL level that just yep. weren't ready. And there's a, to me, there's two sides to that. One is they aren't ready to, to play in the NHL. Secondly is they probably didn't earn the chance to get there. Yep. And then that sends the wrong message in your organization I think, to the guys already at the NHL level and some of the others that are trying to get there that, you know, you don't have to earn your way in. You might just get hand selected uh, and plugged in there. Uh, you know, I don't want to name names in particular. You sure. can go back and look at the opening day roster from two seasons ago and last year, and you can see a bunch of names that not only aren't in the Sharks uh, NHL organization, they're not in our organization at all. They're not in the NHL at all. So I think we tried to shove some people into roles uh, out of um, desperation maybe because we just were so lean on, on NHL quality draft picks that we tried to, you know, you cross your fingers, yeah. that if you throw enough against the wall, a few will stick. And it, and it just, it didn't work well enough. And uh, I think what, what happened as well is it deteriorated the culture of the dressing room. And it wasn't a good room where the guys um, were united and playing for one another. Even if you're having a losing season, and right now the Sharks are, that doesn't mean you can't play for one another and have each other's back. And I think there was, there was it, it was fractured in some ways because of some of those things, you know, and I'm not in there, so it's not fair yeah. for me to make the total, um, uh, you know, determination of what was wrong in the dressing room. There's some individuals who are gone um, that were part of that too. And, and, and I think everybody knows those stories, but I think uh, getting the dressing room culture right and finding a group of guys that wanted to play for one another was really important. And part of that was um, having a more veteran group that came in. I mean, when we started this season in uh, Prague, there was not one rookie in the lineup. Mm. There was not one rookie on the team. Uh, Chichek made the trip because we were allowed to take extra players mm. in case um, there was an injury and you couldn't fly somebody in from San Jose in time. But there was no rookies in those games. And even now, uh, you know, Chichek has come in and, and spent some time and Cease has come in and, and played a game or two. Uh, and then we had um, 
uh, the goaltender, McIniemi, yeah. mm-hmm. um, come in. But that's 30 games in. I mean, for the first two months, this was a pretty much just an all-veteran group. And it might still be now if it weren't for injuries. Um, so there has been, I think, a, a real um, concerted effort by Greer to get the room right, get things settled down, see who these, how these veteran guys fit in that have been brought in, who works, who doesn't, who you might look to move at the deadline, uh, who you might um, uh, you know, subtract at the end of the year if they're in a mm-hmm. contract year or renew. And then at the same time, in a parallel world, watch what's going on with the Barracuda. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, I, and I think this is, was also very much uh, Mike's plan. Put William Eklund with the Barracuda. Yeah. Put Thomas Bortolo with the Barracuda. Put Tristan Robbins with the Barracuda. Uh, and, and so on down the line, some of our, our top prospects yeah. and, and, the, and the young goaltenders, uh, Strauss Mann and McIniemi and, and, uh, and others. And let them play. And let them get to the point where they are starting to dominate yeah. and then push the ceiling of the NHL group. Mm-hmm. and. Put some pressure on those veteran guys in there that maybe aren't working out and then you now you're talking about guys that are earning their way into the nhl and then your your top veterans who are at the nhl level are going to look at the guys coming up saying hey that guy earned it he wasn't handed it that's breeding competition between the ahl and the nhl level i think it's it, you have to have it mm-hmm. and uh and i think that while uh i i think Right now, the other night, we counted um, in the lineup. It was probably in the game against Vancouver. The Sharks had only seven drafted players in that game. (laughs) Uh, The rest were trades or free agents. And you probably want that ratio to be higher among your own drafted and developed players in today's game. But again, you rewind and you go back to the years when Doug was trying to push us over the top and get that extra player or two to try and win a cup. You can't knock him for that either. And when he made some of those moves, I mean, the day he got Eric Carlson, and and I remember, and he didn't. I thought he didn't have to give up Hurdle because we thought for <laughs> yeah. sure he would have to uh, part with a player like that, and he didn't. Yeah. I mean, I I was excited that this is what it was going to be, what it took. But they got to the conference finals. Yeah, yeah, they did, and you know, Eric just couldn't stay healthy after yeah. that, and couldn't mm-hmm. put a whole season together. And there were other factors too. But boy, he's sure playing great now. Yeah, he is. <laughs> you, you, you said uh, you were excited. I think you recall we were excited too. If it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you remember what I was doing in that video? Because you, you said it during the, sh- the, the show. You don't yeah. remember? I was making it rain. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, that's right. right. Okay. <laughs> that video still gets views and a lot of troll comments yeah. from yeah. people. I'm sure you don't back. regret that at no, all. No, not at all. <laughs> but it brings in the views, so I don't mind. Exactly. <laughs> well, the, uh, the Sharks are um, fourth from worst in the NHL when it comes to uh, points percentage. Hey, that's are. 28th from best. Oh, I'm sorry. 28th from best. Who am I to argue? <laughs> um, yeah, so... <laughs> um, what advice would you have for uh, Sharks fans who are watching this team and, and hoping for more, but the, the product that they're getting on the ice uh, night in and night out has just, you know, the losses are piling up. Right. I, I think that um, we're still in the uh, going through the process part of all this newness that you yeah. just described, uh, you know, from the, from the entire coaching staff on down and so many other things and players adjusting. You know, like the goaltending position, I gotta think if you're, if you're a guy like um, Kakinen, you know, you, you were in the Minnesota Wild organization and, you know, coached a certain way and taught a certain way, and then all of a sudden, you're not there anymore. You come to San Jose, and then you get taught and coached a certain way again from the trade deadline on to the end of the season, and then that coaching staff is gone, and now Nabby's not the NHL yep. coach anymore. Now he's the director of goaltending. And Thomas Spear comes in, and he's now yeah. the, the goaltending coach. And now you've got to work with all new people again. Um, I don't know about you guys, but if in any job we were in, it's just like, what are we doing here? Like, yeah. what, what do you want from me? And in that uh, ultra-critical position in our game, uh, a younger goalie like him uh, might f- fight that a little bit, struggle sure. like that, struggle with that a little bit, and and I think that's been part of the situation for for Capo. Um, but you know, I would say w- enjoy the process because I think 
this team will get better as we go along. And, and some of these home games where we just come up a goal short yeah. or lose in overtime, you know, some of those I think will start turning our way. Uh, do we have a, 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 am I gonna sit here and say, hey, this is a playoff team? You know, right now it doesn't look like that. And, and we, we've fallen, you know, as of today, we're probably eight or nine points, you know, legitimately out of a playoff spot. But it is the Western Conference, which is not like the East. If you're eight or That's nine right. out in the East now, it's over. Yeah. I mean, you might as well forget about it. Um, but in the West, there's, there's a little bit more flexibility in the second half of the playoff race um, from the division you know, leaders on down through the wild cards, where if you go on a little bit of a run, you can, you can become relevant again. So hopefully that happens. I, I would love for the Sharks in, in April, uh, March and April to be playing games that matter, at least for most of those months. And, and hopefully they will be. But, you know, I think that we will see some of these uh, Barracuda players push that ceiling and break through. Uh, we're already seeing it a little bit, as we mentioned, some of the guys that have come up. And, uh, you know, we may have some pleasant surprises in that regard. Uh, and just the continued development of the guys that are here now and the, the, the level of comfort. And, you know, we've already talked about Nico Sturm. Uh, you know, I, I had lunch with Mike Greer today and, and we were talking about how much we miss Nico Sturm for those eight games. Yeah. He, he just, all of a sudden, our middle six group of forwards changed when he went out that it didn't feel as dynamic yeah. and now two games back it's already more dynamic and he has scored in both those <laughs> games now Benino's scoring you know so yeah. more opportunities are coming in for for some of those uh, middle tier forwards so um you know as nico gets more comfortable and you see the confidence he has i didn't get a chance to watch as much of him when he played for the wild mm -hmm. but now he's won a cup i mean you mm -hmm. you got to be a different player after you win a cup and you come in with a different uh, level of confidence in the way you play and, and you're, you're viewed by your peers differently now too, as a guy that can be counted on and relied on. Uh, and Matt Nieto's had a renaissance bounce back season mm -hmm. and unfortunately has been hurt again, but it's been so great to see him and the way he's played this year. Uh, so, you know, I, I think the best for this season is still ahead of us. Whether or not it's good enough to, to get us <laughs> there uh, remains to be seen. But uh, I, I just, you know, every season, and I probably said this last time I was on, every season for every team is a roller coaster ride wrapped up in a soap opera. <laughs> and, you know, that's what it's been for the Sharks to some degree already this season. Um, I think we've had a lot of soap opera in the last three years. Yeah. We could use less of that. Uh, and, and I think we'll see less of that because that dressing room's a lot better and united and bonded. Um, but it's, for me, it's still fun to come to the game every night. And, you know, they, they still win teams against teams, uh, win games against yeah. teams you thought, well, they're not gonna go in and win <laughs> that game. And then they do. So the line is still very fine in our league night to night. And when the Sharks have it all together, they can play with anybody. So I feel like these games are losing, sure, but they're not getting blown out in these games. They're always close. They're always within a goal or two. So it's not like it, there's always a chance every night. It's not like it's, it's like I feel like Anaheim only has one, I think as of today, one regulation win still in the season and it's almost Christmas time. To me, that's absurd. And uh, the Sharks just aren't that bad. Like when you watch them, it's not that bad. It's fun. It's entertaining. They lose six to five. That's 11 goals in the game. That's a lot going on. So it's not so bad. And I don't think you can accuse this group of not working hard. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as a paying fan or a viewing customer or a listening fan, uh, you want to know that if you're going to donate your time uh, uh, and allocate your dollars to mm -hmm. this kind of thing because you enjoy it, you want the guys to be working hard and trying hard. And I, I feel like our team does that. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like they take nights off and there's not guys dogging it. And uh, I just feel like it's a hard working group. We have a great coaching staff of really smart people, but really good people as well. Uh, you know, David Quinn talking to him about the penalty kill. He says, I'm not crazy. What, what am I going to mess with the penalty kill? It was <laughs> yeah. second best in the NHL last year. But Ryan Warsawski, who's, who's, um, who comes from a championship last season in the American Hockey League and runs our penalty kill, he still wants to put his fingerprints on it and, and tweak it and adjust it here and there. Uh, but they're smart enough to know that you don't want to change the whole structure of it because it worked and will work. 
so we have a lot of good things going on, and uh, I, I still think there's more talent in at the Barracuda level, and maybe even beyond there that we haven't quite seen. Uh, and everybody's cream won't rise to the top, but someone's will. Uh, and I think before this season's over, we'll have some pleasant surprises of players doing things that we didn't expect they would. Yeah, you talk about those hard workers, and, and I've always told Aaron and, and the folks on the show know this too. Um, one of my favorite players on the team isn't exactly the most high-skilled guy, but is Mario Ferraro. And like, yes, he's, he's a great uh, personality, but if you watch him play, he never stops moving his feet. If the puck goes in the corner, he's crashing and banging in the corner as hard and as fast as he can. He never gives up. And you brought up Nico Sturm and the impact that he had, or he, he I guess that the team lacked when he was gone. Coming back two games, it seems like it's a different team. And a lot of that has to do with his work ethic. And it's the same as Mario Ferraro, those two guys. Uh, they just never stop moving. Yeah. Um, so for for me, I, I'm again we we've coined this season as yeah we're we're probably not going to be a playoff team. That's <laughs> fine. But are they entertaining at least? And we think that so far they have. And one guy who's been incredibly entertaining. I know we were going to talk about him. Now we're at now we're there. Is Eric Carlson, right? And Eric Carlson has just kind of rejuvenated himself. He's been healthy. I think is the main thing, right? So he's getting the days off from practices that he feels he needs. Uh, and it seems to be working out really well. So for, for Eric Carlson, I think the main difference for me has been not only is he healthy, but Brent Burns isn't there anymore. And we posed this question and we got answers from, from our viewers. And I'm curious to what you think. Was Burns' exit kind of the catalyst for Eric Carlson to do what he's doing this season in that he is the man on the blue line now. There is no question about who's going to be running, the, which power player, whatever. He's he's the guy that they're looking to on the blue line for offense. Did Brent Burns' departure kind of help kickstart that? I think it did. I think it was a great trade for both players. Burns is doing great in Carolina, mm -hmm. and he must feel like he's more of the man there yeah. now, mm -hmm. uh, which probably makes him a lot more comfortable. Although I haven't talked to him about that, but um, you know, and Eric is. Uh, you know, I've heard some questions posed to him about that, and he, he's a little bit non-committal to that, and I don't want to say evasive, but I don't think he want, wants to make anybody look bad, and, and not the least of which would be his former teammate, Brent Burns. And, and I don't feel like there was an adversarial relationship right. there. I don't mean that at all. But I, I, I think there's, there's a swagger there from Eric now that he's being able to back up on the ice mm -hmm. because of his health. Uh, that we hadn't seen before, uh, you know, except for some stretches of time. Uh, and we're now seeing the Eric Carlson that we thought we were going to see as yeah. soon as we got him and through, a, uh, you know, a variety of situations, uh, injuries probably being number one, we didn't get that. But he seems to be in a really good place right now. And I think you've probably hit on one of the reasons why that he feels like it's, you know, I'm not saying it's his team. Logan sure. is our captain. Yeah. But I think you know the vibe. He, he's, he's a big part of that leadership group and, and takes it upon himself. And I've also seen him, uh, I felt at times when he struggled that, and then you would hear the, the comments of, of Boogie or, or, you know, at the time, like, how coachable is Eric? <laughs> or is he so set in his ways that he's just <laughs> going to give himself the green light when he yeah. wants to? But even recently, and Quinn has talked about um, the Sharks perhaps pushing too hard to get offense and taking chances and, and risking. And I've seen Carlson just dial back that little bit. And when you watch the game as closely as somebody who has to call the, <laughs> each, each pass of the puck, you notice those subtle little times when he might have just gone for it. And now he's, I'm not saying hesitating, Restraint. but he's... He's reading things a little differently, keeping in mind that, especially of late, the Sharks, you know, they got scored on eight times in Seattle. I yeah. mean, a lot of pucks were ending up in their net, and it wasn't fair to the goalies. You couldn't hang that all on the goalies. They were facing too many grade-A chances. Um, and you do have to play defensively in this league, even though scoring is up. And, you know, there's a big buzz that now it's, a, it's a, an offensive player's league. You know, it's, to some extent that's true, but you still got to play defense. And, and at the end of the day, the, the team that usually does the best job of that wins the Stanley Cup. And I, I think Eric is taking that to heart, showing that, yes, he's very coachable and wants this thing to get better and wants this thing to work. And at the same time, it makes him a more valuable player 
uh, whether he stays in San Jose for the rest of his career or doesn't. Um, you know, uh, despite the conventional feeling that his contract is untradeable, nobody's untradeable. Absolutely. Um, and I think um, Greer has said he's listening, uh, he'll listen to anybody, at least it's been reported that he would uh, listen to, you know, talk about any player except Hurdle, I think that yep. w was reported. I, I haven't asked Mike if that's what he said, but that's mm -hmm. what's been reported. So it's only good for the Sharks. It's only good for Eric if he keeps playing the way he is, but he's been so fun to watch. One, one of the other main differences I noticed with Eric Carlson specifically was the penalty kill time. His time on penalty kill over the, the, the seasons, you can go natural stat check and check it out. But this season, only eight minutes in 29 games, mm -hmm. whereas in, in previous seasons, um, you know, 50 something games because he was injured, but he was, you know, 70 minutes on the penalty kill. So it seems like now they're kind of reserving him and his energy to be more offensively based. So the guys that are coming in and, and uh, playing on the penalty kill, they may not be Eric Carlson, but as we've stated, second best penalty kill in the league. So it seems to be working with regardless of the personnel. Yeah, right? and, and, and some analytics may play into that as well. And I don't know this, but, you know, if you're, if you're a new coaching staff coming in, and you're trying to break down how can I get the most out of Eric Carlson and also taking his age into effect. Yeah. He's not a kid anymore. Uh, and then you go back and break down the times he broke down. Now, a forearm injury, that's different. Yeah. That, yeah, but but I'm talking lower body injuries. When did Eric Carlson get hurt? How many minutes was he playing? Was he overused on some back-to-backs? I mean, all these things are, believe me, dissected to the, uh, to the max to try and figure out how, how to best manage, um, you know, arguably your best player. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Quinn's effort to squeeze the most that he possibly can out of Eric Carlson with, without uh, making him more susceptible to those kind of injuries, you know, there's some you can't avoid, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's probably going into the way that he's used in some of his minutes as well, trying to maximize that. Quinn also went to visit him in Ottawa in the off season before the season started. And that supposedly kick-started a rejuvenation as well. I think they had a sit-down talk of, okay, I want you to be the guy on the power play. We're going to limit you on penalty kill minutes so that you're fresher mm -hmm. and give you days off. And I think that really helped Carlson in, in starting the season off hot, which he normally does not do in his career. Yeah, I, I agree. He's, he's, been, uh, he's been terrific since day one. And, you know, our fans and us and all of us are... <laughs> Now we're seeing what the fans in Ottawa were so um, reluctant to say goodbye to. He's, he's absolutely an amazing player. He didn't win two Norris trophies by accident. And, uh, you know, I, from a defensive standpoint, I put him on a level of being able to pass the puck the way Joe Thornton yep. could as a forward. Mm -hmm. That's, I, when we got him, that was what I coined him. I said, he's Joe Thornton <laughs> on the blue line. Like, but he skates better. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. Then faster. Um, then faster, yes. Um, so thank you for all that. I appreciate it. Um, but Aaron's got some technology questions. Sure. Uh -oh. so, yeah, changing yeah. gears a little bit here from, from the team. He's stuck uh, on his iPhone, can't figure out the Bluetooth. So he's <laughs> well, yeah, more of, um, I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. It was in standard definition. Then we saw high definition, which I think was a big jump for hockey. Now we're in 4K, which isn't quite the same jump. But what kind of future of technology do you see coming to the NHL that would help both the viewer at home and also the viewer maybe at the actual game? Well, you know, the, the first type of technology that will improve the game to me is more cameras in, in more optimum locations. And I, I've seen some cameras that are embedded in the boards that I really like and, and some of that technology. I'm not sure I've ever loved the ref cam that they tried out a few times. <laughs> it just didn't seem to bring much more to, uh, to the sport than was already there. Um, last year in the playoffs, TNT were the first to use a camera that brought into sharp focus the first thing in front of it and then soft focus in the back. I, I, don't, I should know the name of this type of camera, but I don't. That's not my department but w some of the pictures were just and now you see it in the NFL where the you'll see the quarterback and everything behind it looks just a little bit blurred it's a cinematic look um, I've loved some of that 
Um, I, I always love the more audio we can get, the better. Um, and you know, there's some limitations within that uh, because you have to filter out profanity and language. Yeah. I know this would be a shock to most of you, but sometimes in a hockey game down on the ice, there's profanity. Um, so I'm not sure that you can do a whole lot with that. Um, you know, and they've tried the wired cameras over top and some of those have worked better uh, than others. I, I don't really know what's on the forefront in, in uh, the videography part of hockey technology right now, where they're trying to push it to the next level. Uh, we're seeing a lot more um, information that's ending up on our screens. Uh, we're seeing it in the arena on the now, yep. uh, let me get this right, it's not the Jumbotron, it's the center hung. Ah, That's what it's called. I was going to call it the Megatron, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever. I, I, think, I think the company memo was it's the center hung. So I'm going to call it the center hung, the big screen. Uh, and you're seeing real time um, shift lengths and a lot of cool stuff on there. And I'm not sure how well that translates to the screen because I almost think that you get to have almost too much going on there. And there's a certain number of our fans especially ones that don't watch a lot or are new to the sport that are still trying to lock in on where the puck is all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of that data can be distracting, but I'd like to see us get to the point, and I'm sure we will soon, where this real-time data will be, you'll be able to control it from the remote on your set. Yeah. And if you want to see the name pop up of the player who has the puck, you know, that little graphic you see yeah. sometimes, uh, and we may even get the, you know, the glowing puck on a slap shot <laughs> back if you want it, yeah. um, but it'll be an option. Uh, to me, those would be the kind of little video game-ish type bells and whistles that if you could control them uh, with a separate control unit when you're watching on your huge 80 inch screen, which yeah. a lot of people have now, yeah. those would be cool and more replicate what the center hung looks like <laughs> at an arena. Do you guys have access to all that stats, or are you only seeing it on the center tron? We have access to it, but I, I'll tell you, uh, it, the, like, Hetty will sometimes have a monitor next to him with all that real-time data. And it's valuable sometimes, but our game moves so fast yeah. that you don't really have time to look at it like that. Because yeah. you just look away and you just missed a goal or a hit or a you know something yeah um so it can be distracting too so there's an art to it and it's something that probably takes a while to get used to but i i find myself sometimes looking up at the center hung mm -hmm. um and i'll see that you know uh so and so's shift is now one it vlasic has been out there for 143 because yeah. he got caught in the second period in his own end and we get hemmed in and you go like uh oh you know and you might mention it or you might not but you are aware of it um and so that that is a good thing and if you're in the arena you get to see that stuff now too so i i've liked that implementation of the uh the real-time data that's one of my favorite things on i think the broadcast right now is when it's a long shift it'll drop down kind of the pictures of the yeah. players and give you their, like the count is going. It's an ongoing count of how long the shift is. Yeah, I think it has to be used judiciously because yeah, it, yeah. it can get to be distracting and you can overload the viewer with like too many numbers and stuff like that. Just like with the moving um, advertisement mm -hmm. on the, uh, the virtual boards now, uh, I think they've already adjusted that a little bit where there was some animation going on in some of those ads. Yeah. And it was like, wait a minute here, I'm trying to watch the game and there's a rolling yeah. soccer ball promoting <laughs> the World Cup on the screen behind a guy, you know. And, and I have already seen the tweaking going on there where they're starting to dial that in I like where uh, they, uh, as they, they learn about that. Sorry, I like what they said, uh, close one, and it was a car that was driving around the boards and there was a player headed right for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Looks oh, like there's no, about this, to be a collision. This won't end well. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, so do you have any last second questions? Uh, no, I mean the new technology I think is great. I think it's going to help. I mean the NFL to me does it the best, but the NFL's made for TV. I feel like the NFL's made for TV and hockey is made for in person. It's hard to kind of blend the two together. Um, the, the, the NFL, you can break down after every play what just happened. NHL, you can't really do that unless there's a lot more stoppages, which we're not seeing nearly right. as much as it used to be. Uh, you know, to me, the big big advancement this past year, especially when you see the playoffs in the Stanley Cup, was the two new networks, ESPN and TNT. And, and it's so good because they're two huge companies, Disney and, and Time Warner. 
uh, and, and they're pushing each other and they don't want to be the one that's behind. And I sort of felt like at the end of the Stanley Cup, TNT was ahead of ESPN in the way they were covering the games and the panel and they had Gretzky and, and you know, they had Paul Bissonnette <laughs> yeah. and, you know, th that Rick Tockett and there was a good yeah. vibe on there. Even on the nights Gretzky wasn't there. But now ESPN's upping their studio game and, and I was talking about this today. Um, P.K. Subban's on there now. Mm -hmm. He and Ryan McDonough, I saw them the other night. There's a real chemistry there uh, and, and they're both current enough players, recent enough players that they know everybody in the league pretty much and can speak to the game in today's terms. And as much as I love Mark Messi and Chris Chelios, they're from that other era yeah. and, and, um, and they're also of like mind. I like it when there's varying opinions. So I, I've really enjoyed how the, uh, the, the presentation of the games on those two major networks has kind of turned into a bit of a competition and that can only help, help all of us watching it at that uh, most important time of the year. It, it makes things great when uh, when they're pushing the you know pushing the boundaries uh, yeah. against one another. I love Bessonette and Gretzky. They're just the two <laughs> complete opposite career people. Like how they play in the NHL, just couldn't be any more dissimilar. From yeah, that's, that's for great. sure. Uh, one last question, I guess I got. Oh. Uh, is it weird to be to see sons of NHL players that you were calling <laughs> now in the NHL because? For me, it's weird because I grew up watching like Kachuk and Ulf and, some, and well, Ulf Dahlin, yeah. like, and then now their kids are playing in the NHL. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm, am I that old? I am that old. I am. I'm really old. Yeah. So, <laughs> is it? Do you ever like to me? My I have an older brother. He's two years older than me, and all throughout school, I was called Jason, right. and I just gave up. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm Jason. Like I'm no longer Aaron. <laughs> I'm Jason because the teachers can't keep a track of it. Um, do you ever mix up the names at all? Is it really hard to keep oh, track? Oh, that's happened yeah. from time to time. Um, my, my oldest son, Randall, uh, last week turned 30. <laughs> so I now have a 30-year-old kid. Yeah. So um, that was a, a real reminder how much time <laughs> has passed. Uh, but it, it is wonderful to see it, and it's been a big part of hockey over the years that the bloodlines tend to, to carry over from generation to generation, and there's a lot of uh, players in the NHL now whose fathers were NHL players as well, or uncles were, you know, related in some way. Um, <laughs> I, somehow I missed this the other night when Jonah Gadjevich uh, scored uh, against... Uh, Brother-in-law. Brother yeah, yeah. In, in, against Vancouver. Was it Spencer uh, uh, Martin? Martin. Yeah. Um, that's his brother-in-law. Yeah. So, so Spencer Martin sister is married to Jonah Gadjevich. Mm -hmm. Like somehow I missed that. It wasn't in the game notes. <laughs> and then they were taking a picture down on the ice. I wonder why they were. And it turns out that they're, they're, fan, they're, uh, they're um, relatives. So I guess uh, when, when Gadjevich scored that goal, uh, he put it upstairs where his sister hides the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> it's not grandma. <laughs> but but Ruzanowski probably got that memo, huh? He probably yeah. did. Dan's a savant, so he, he probably <laughs> knew that going in. But uh, yeah, it is a little bit um, interesting. Uh, and we always tell that Kachuk story because for me, it, it, was, uh, it was their dad and uh, yeah. Walt, as we call him. Um, and uh, now both of his sons are uh, not just playing, yeah, they're stars in the NHL. Yeah, yeah. And, and so it goes. And soon uh, I'll have uh, a 45-year-old son and who knows, <laughs> you know, Brady Kachuk's kid will be in the yeah. NHL. <laughs> uh, I, well, we, we're, we're wrapped That's then, it, aren't we, yeah. huh? Man, um, just uh, amazing. Thank you so much for your time. The, the man, not a myth, the legend. Best hair in the room, uh, <laughs> part half by default there. Uh, but uh, thank you again. Congratulations on your 2000th uh, Sharks game called Amazing. I'm sure you've got another 2000 in you. Yeah. And we'll be listening to him. Sharks Nation, you guys are so spoiled to have him night in, night out, <laughs> making these calls. So again, thank you so much for doing this. And also want to say thank you to Jeff Mace yeah. of Calorain Wines. Uh, for providing us with this beautiful scenery, beautiful yeah. backdrop, uh, the, the beautiful wine. And yeah. uh, once we're done, uh, I think I'll grab, I'll grab a glass. Yes, but, uh, absolutely. We'll, we'll and and if I could ask yeah. one favor, uh -huh. when the Fin Factor has their 2000th oh, episode, <laughs> that you have me back. I we'll get, we're hope at. to have you back before 2000, <laughs> but uh, it's a promise. I promise to roll in on my walkers. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much again. Appreciate it. Guys, uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this as much as we have. 
Uh, I guess that's it. Any last little bit you want to say uh-huh. something to them? You any last little bit much. for the for the fans? Yeah. Just thumbs up. Go sharks. Go sharks. Go sharks. Love it, guys. For super producer Jason, I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. And that's Randy Hahn. The man, we will see you guys next week. Next week. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, check out our other content, especially interviews. You can interact with us directly through social media at the Fin Factor and on Instagram at Fin Factor. And don't forget to join our live streams on YouTube. Visit our website at thefinfactor.com, where you'll find all of our episodes as videos or podcasts. You'll also find our exclusive merchandise to help support our show.